Hey folks, and welcome back to Fireside Farms. We are right in the thick of summer. It's the beginning of August, and we're gonna be heading into, hopefully, a good monsoon season here in the desert southwest. And that means one of my favorite native desert trees is starting to fruit. Today we are gonna be talking all about the mesquite tree, which is arguably one of the most important native trees here in the desert. Now the mesquite tree of the Prosopis species is a woody leguminous shrub or tree found all over the United States. But it holds significant historical value to indigenous cultures across the Southwest. As a member of the bean family, a legume, it fixes nitrogen in the soil. It's also a beneficial shade plant as some species can grow to be 40 feet tall with widespread branches. There are three main types of mesquite in this area. Um, they're gonna be the Texas honey mesquite, the screw bean mesquite, and the velvet mesquite. Um, but I'm only gonna be talking about two mesquite trees primarily found in my location and only two that grow on my property, which are the honey mesquite and the screw bean mesquite. You can identify mesquite by the sharp, very sharp spines on its branches, the yellow clusters of flowers, sometimes they're white, called catkins, found blooming in the summer and by the small little leaflets that the tree has. Once the flowers are pollinated, it turns into a delectable little bean pod, which is then harvested once dry for food. The Texas honey mesquite is said to have the best flavor of all of the mesquite tree varieties, um, but all of, all of the bean pods from mesquite trees are edible. This tree is a wonderful and necessary pioneer species for the arid southwest. They have really, really long tap roots that can reach deep into the soil and unlock water sources from hidden aquifers, bringing those nutrients and everything back up to the leaves where they then fall on the ground in the winter. They also have smaller rootlets closer to the surface of the soil to help catch up any possible rainwater that may fall during the monsoon season. And then during a drought, those rootlets will die and droughts actually stimulate the tree to send its taproot down even further. Because of its nitrogen fixing abilities, the area directly underneath the canopy of a mesquite tree can actually be three to seven times more nitrogenous than the surrounding area. And as its leaf litter continues to build up near the base of the tree every winter, it starts to build a mound that some people called a resource island for other plants that need a little bit of shelter, shade, or more rich soil to live in. It's considered a nurse plant in the desert, meaning that it oftentimes helps other plants that may need a little bit of shade or shelter to thrive underneath its canopy. It's also a great resource for birds and insects and even animals like ruminants that feed on the pods when they fall to the ground. And this wonderful tree has further uses beyond it being essential to many arid desert environments. Historically, its hardwood has been used to make fence posts in constructions of homes and ramada. It's a great firewood, I'm sure you've seen it in the store, and it is the preferred wood to use for the greatest Texas barbecue. The Pima Indians use its thick black sap as a hair dye, and it has been dissolved in water to do paintings on old indigenous pottery. And that same tar can be used as a natural glue. Southwestern natives also use the wood to make various tools such as harpoons, bows, arrows, and other things. Medicinally, the black pitch, the tar that comes out of the tree itself, has been used to treat various types of fungal infections or bacterial infections. The sap has been used to put directly over a wound, such as the way that Indians have used pine tar as well. And you can also boil the sap and use it as a mouthwash for gum infections, tooth pain. The leaves are also edible. All of this tree is edible in some way or another and have been used to chew down into like a poultice, put on pl places you have gum pain, mouth pain, or swallow the tea for digestive issues. But where the mesquite tree truly shines is its historical use as a food. As I said before, the entirety of the mesquite tree is edible, but the only really good tasting part is this bean pod. A mesquite pod is eaten whole, although there are little tiny beans inside here, which you can hear when you shake them. But most of the flavor of the sweetness of the mesquite comes from the pod itself. So when you break this open, should snap if it's completely dry and ready to be eaten. The pod is very sweet. 
But there are small beans in here that are very, very hard. You can chip a tooth on these things. That means that when you process um, your mesquite pods, you'll either need to use some sort of professional mill if you can get your hands near one, or as the indigenous peoples used to do, grind it up, just work on it with a rock mortar and pestle, which I'm very thankful for mills nowadays. <laughs> If I, can get, if I can get one of these beans open. Just, all right, there you are. So this is what the actual seed inside the bean pod looks like. Now the mesquite pods themselves are really, really quite nutritious. They have about 35% protein, which is more than you can get from eating just one soybean. And the flavor is usually described as earthy, sweet, and kind of chocolatey, depending on how you prepare it. The pods are generally ground up into a meal or sifted out and made into a flour and then can be used to make little cakes or tamales or tortillas. And mesquite flour is naturally gluten-free, but because it is naturally gluten-free, if you actually want to use mesquite flour to make some sort of rising bread, you'll have to mix it with wheat flour to get that rise out of it. The pods have been used because of its chocolatey, earthy flavor. Um, as a substitute for coffee and then you can also make a tea or a broth more like it a warm drink um, That's traditional. It's called atole out of the pods itself by boiling it in water adding things like sugar Maybe some masa or molasses and mesquite flour can still be found nowadays across across the US in several stores, but if you live in the Arizona in the state of Arizona, I don't know the specific areas because I don't live in Arizona, but I've looked it up. <laughs> they do have community mills where every summer people will go and harvest their mesquite pods from trees or, or out in the desert naturally, and then they will take it to this community mill and the people there will mill it for you into flour, which is super cool if you live in the Arizona area and you're watching this video and you've used that, please comment down below and let me know how it went because I'm very jealous. <laughs> So now that you know all about the mesquite tree, um, let me show you the two types that I have on my property. The first is the honey mesquite, which has pods shaped like this that are flat. And when you shake them, you can hear the beans inside. The next is the screw bean mesquite, which is used less often, but still just as tasty. And that's because it looks like a screw. So I'm gonna be going over when and how to harvest mesquite today. I will not be making anything with mesquite because I think this video will run long enough, but this will be a second video where I am going to make some mesquite tea with the pots that I pull off today. So when mesquite is ready to be harvested, it will turn into this brown, dry, brittle pod. Uh, and that, that's when it's time for harvest. Before that, it's still this green, squishy, not ready to be harvested yet, bean pod. But what you mainly wanna do is harvest the pods off the trees. You do not wanna be harvesting any pods that you find that have already fallen to the ground because mesquite beans have a tendency to develop this mold that has a toxin called aflatoxin, which is no good. So you only wanna be harvesting the dried, ripe bean pods directly from the tree, preferably because of this mold that has a tendency to grow on them. You also want to do this before your summer monsoon season. You don't want to be harvesting wet pods that maybe have been allowed to mildew on the tree. And if it has rained, if you get like a sprinkle and the tree gets wet, etc., etc., just let them dry out and then harvest them. Do not harvest wet mesquite pods and do your best to harvest before the summer rains come. The pods that are ready should easily fall off into your hand. You don't want to be tugging on them and, and trying too hard to uh, lose them from the tree. The tree will let you know when it's time to harvest these. Um, there's gonna be pods littered all over the ground and you touch one of these, it should just drop right into your hand. Those are the bean pods you wanna harvest. Now I did a, just a handful today. Um, I, I, missed, I missed the first flush window of a bunch of bean pods because they're littering the ground right here and there's not too much in the tree, but there are plenty of green ones that have yet to ripen. So I will come back another day, harvest some more. What you're gonna wanna do with these bean pods after you've harvested them is lay them out to dry. If they snap, that's good to know they're ready, but sometimes 
they don't snap and see that's still that's still wet and that's not a bean pod you want you want them to be completely dry so you can use your oven on the lowest setting a dehydrator if you have one just follow the same rules you would if you were picking uh, dry storage beans from your garden and you needed the pods to completely dry and the beans to cure before you put them away for storage that's exactly how you want these mesquite beans so thank you guys for joining me on this quick little tour of mesquites uh, i've mostly used my neighbor's property she has a ton of honey mesquites on her property i mostly just have screw bean mesquites but these are the tastiest ones to use is the honey mesquite I have several references. I will be listing them down below if you want to find more information on mesquite trees. Also a couple books that I own. I will be listing those down below as well. Amazing books. Or if you just want to check out the author Gary Paul Navhan. He's an amazing author. Loves mesquite. Writes about it very eloquently. So for now I'm going to go take these in to dehydrate and I will catch you guys on the next one.